conditions, and it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Greg McGowan and Thomas Anderson. They're going to be talking about solving the problem, getting cleanup done right in challenging settings. Um, and they're going to provide some examples of challenging response situations and discuss strategies and tactics, innovation and compromises to deploy um, on challenging responses. So um, who's talking first? Greg, are you talking first? I will be. Okay, so I'm going to introduce um, um, Thomas and then I'm going to introduce Greg and we can go straight away. So um, we've got Thomas Anderson is one of our speakers and he's Lieutenant Anderson is a center, Central Field Response Patrol Lieutenant at OSPA. Um, he joined OSPA after retiring from the United States Navy, and he's also been an on-scene coordinator for multiple large incidents throughout California, um, and included responses in two of the largest oil fields in the United States. That's pretty exciting. Um, and then Greg, um, he is a response technology program manager at OSPA. Um, so he works on things like best achievable technology, applied response technology, Fishery Closure, Oil Wildlife, Marine uh, Wildlife Veterinary Care and Research Center, and the GS team. So he oversees a lot of different people. Um, and he's responded to spills across the US and abroad. And also, he's also a professional ecologist, so close to my own heart, like myself. Uh, so thank you, Greg. Thank you very much. I uh, will share here. Um, that's interesting, okay. So you should be seeing my presentation, is that right? Uh, it's just coming up. Yes, I see it. And in full screen, I hope? I think so, yes. Okay. Um, okay, so thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, one of the challenges of going later on in a long uh, session like this is that some people may cover topics that you've covered. And in fact, that's the case. So we'll have to, uh, we may move quickly over a few of these things and particularly being in a session like this one where I have to follow amazing presentations by Alex and Maria. Uh, I feel a little bit sheepish, but we shall press on regardless. Appreciate all the help from Lieutenant Anderson working this together. We're gonna kind of just tag team as we go along through here. Uh, first incident we're going to talk about is the Simric 1Y incident. This was in the Central Valley of California. Uh, as was mentioned yesterday, this release was associated with the steam injection process used to produce oil in the oil field. And there were definitely some uh, significant challenges we had to face. And, and I should maybe say, as we go through this, uh, I'm going to be presenting some of the things more that I, from my particular uh, world of largely wildlife and some environmental type unit type things, and uh, Lieutenant Anderson will be talking more about from the SOSC and the uh, executive kind of leadership part of the command as we go through this. Um, so at least from my vantage and, and probably from Tom's too, the, the two most significant elements that uh, came up here, that there were a lot of steep cliffs in this area. So we really had a hard time getting down uh, to the, oil, the edge of the oil. There were active expressions. For those of you not familiar with it, expressions are uh, essentially little, and they resemble little volcanoes. You can see the spray here. It's, it's a mixture of steam and oil uh, bubbling out of the earth at very high temperature, and in some cases, relatively high pressure. Um, so that meant, again, we couldn't get down to the edge. And that, that really leads to two key elements. If you can't get to the oil, you can't recover the oil. Uh, and similarly, from on my side, if you if there's wildlife affected by the oil and you can't get down there, you can't recover the oil either. Uh, Tom, are there things from your side that I didn't cover yet? No, you're doing great, Greg. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Lieutenant Anderson, Tom. Uh, is there <laughs> <a big set? laughs> yes. Um, the big thing that I was going to cover is that, like Greg was referring to, our, our surface expressions that were coming up. The, the problem with that is that we didn't have any way to have definitive underground mapping. So we couldn't tell if there were voids or areas where personnel would get close to and they could fall into a sinkhole. So safety being our primary consideration, we kept everybody out of that, that media area. Um, then another big nuance to this, it was just, as you can see in the picture, we had the governor there. When you have a lot of public oversight from, from state and elected officials, um, 
we also had a lot of the the uh, federal level was involved in this too. So that's a whole different dynamic that we're going to have to be addressing that they will come out and want to see what's going on. And we, we have to balance making sure that the response is adequate and thorough as well as addressing their concerns because they are our representatives and they have a very valid input in the, uh, the direction of our response. Yeah, yeah Greg. Sure. Greg? Yes. Yeah, this is the other Tom. So Tom Cullen here. And um, and thanks for mentioning that, Tom Anderson, because, um, yeah, my recollection, it was amazing how quickly this thing escalated and the amount of work that went into briefing a relatively new uh, administration um, on, on this. It was an AP story that broke in July for this release, this expression that happened, I think it was in, in May, you know, that talked about the hundreds of thousands of gallons of produced water and oil. And... Um, and that's one of those things that you know you don't see it in the incident management handbook, but the political uh, overlay is uh, a significant uh, challenge, and and our liaison efforts uh, went into hyperdrive for this. But thank, thanks for that. Yep, thank you, Administrator Cohen. You're welcome to join us. Um, so as we go on, just a couple of the solutions we were working on. Uh, been a lot of conversation on the during this uh, symposium about remote sensing and the value. Uh, there, it really is profoundly uh, helpful. I'm not going to belabor it because we have uh, talked so much about it already, but you can see here on the left, uh, full color imagery. On the right, the thermal imagery. Again, that was discussed yesterday, but uh, if anyone wasn't on, the, it's the yellow is hot, purple is cold, or darker is cold um, because they had oil mixed with steam. Uh, it showed up quite readily. Um, that was helpful. Uh, you can see the 3D uh, topographic image that was created. Again, when we can't get down there, um, that's useful. And just to, to really point out the uh, resolution of the imagery, this is from that image above, as you can see. And those K-RAT trails are you know six, eight inches wide. So we actually could get the, the UAV down. We had you know biologists uh, operating the UAV, which is a, a great combination for us to go and you know, literally look in the front of burrows to see if there were tracks suggesting uh, that they were uh, active burrows. So really, really helpful. Tom, any comments on these? I think that what really helped is we were just getting our drone program up and running at a much more proficient level. And, and we were able to get some real definitive mapping that helped us with seeing the, the tracks and, and any potential wildlife impacts so that we in turn could have our wildlife branch address more pinpoint, more specific information that, that we could take care of. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, heading right into that, a couple examples, um, the American badger on the top and uh, desert cottontail on the bottom. Um, uh, nocturnal, you know, being able that we had uh, an awful lot of cameras, we'll talk about that in just a second, but to be able to check in on those things and see what's what's happening uh, was was terrific. Um, and we'll talk a little bit, as I say, about that in a second. Just uh, FYI, the American Badger was outside exclusionary fencing at a staging area, not near the oil, and the cottontail was uh, captured, re cleaned, and released uh, back into the wild. So both those guys had good good outcomes. Um, and another thing that uh, Tom maybe couldn't touch on is we ultimately were able to use uh, the UAV imagery looking as we tried to uh, get to our cleanup endpoints and then document and validate that we had achieved cleanup endpoints. Uh, absolutely. But it, it also really the main thing that the, the UAV was able to give us, not just the real time data, it was our ability to get good eyes on what was occurring without having to put personnel into an area that we still were very concerned about our, our uh, surface expression exposure areas. And it helped for us to get, like I said, the real time data, and then we could overlay it on previous days data so that we could see the progression of the incident very clearly. Um, when we were talking about giving the elected officials information, our liaison branch was able to use that data so that they could show them as well 
what we were doing and it, it helped alleviate a lot of the concerns that had been brought up initially. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, exactly. Thank you. Um, and the, so I didn't click on my next bullet here, but just, uh, you know, we have more than 25 trail cameras around, um, diverse and active hazing, lasers, box lights, all, all sorts of things. Um, so, you know, just to, to carry on with uh, what Tom is saying there, you know, there were really unique challenges and difficulties, the surface instability, the unknown voids and that um, hydrogen sulfide can also be an issue. Um, lots of reasons we can't get down there. Um, exclusion fencing uh, is a challenge from the wildlife standpoint. You want your fence to be immediately adjacent to the affected area. We couldn't do that. So as we, we could certainly fence a larger circle around the incident and around the affected area, but in coordination with uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife regional biologists, there were concerns expressed that we could be trapping wildlife, including sensitive wildlife, in, and that they couldn't escape if they wanted to. Um, so uh, some difficult decisions there about, well, do we try and keep big guys out at the risk of keeping some other people in, other animals in, or, or not? Um, one of the most valuable things from my perspective uh, was the use of the trail cameras for wildlife. So we, with in cooperation with uh, the responsible party, we decided to mobilize a pretty robust wildlife branch before there were impacts to wildlife. And by the time, which there were a few, uh, I showed the cottontail earlier, by the time we got to that point, um, we had a group of biologists that were quite well informed as to what species were using at what time of night they were coming and going, which trails they prefer, where, which shrubberies they like to hide in. So when we did end up uh, getting to a point where we needed to do capture efforts, we weren't coming in at, at point A, we were coming in at whatever point R or something well down the road. We knew this is a key trail for cottontails, for example, where they like to forge here at 3 a.m. And so we were able to position traps uh, and things to catch much more effectively, which means that we can get care to those animals much more quickly. So that, that was uh, really, really useful for us. Tom, you wanna to cover some of the strategies and other things that you saw? I, I think that, that Greg's covering it real well, but what I would like to mention when we're talking about the difficulties, one of the things that is very good for how OSPER operates is we have multifaceted disciplines. We have our environmental scientists and the OSPSs and the, and the warden staff, and we rely on each other. So we're able to get information back and forth in a real rapid, rapid sense. And, and addressing a lot of the wildlife issues, we're able to do that rapidly because we have the open communication and go to them directly. Um, and we were able to do a lot of stuff via phone too. With what we're saying that we're getting that good imagery data, Greg could be up in Sacramento and I could send him the documents or the photos needed and we could have a discussion that we were able to get from uh, Diana Grosso flying the drone immediately, getting us the updated information within a couple minutes, get that stuff to, to Greg, get a response back. We could have answers uh, right there within a couple minutes. Um, so that really helped us a lot. Yeah, and uh, uh, for those of you who caught Diana and Judd, uh, and uh, Judd's presentation yesterday, there was conversation. Some of the things we're talking about on that is, do we need to wait? Do we need to do scat once a day? I mean, are we getting to the point with Scatalog where we could do scat twice a day and redeploy assets based on a midday scat update? Um, you know, we can move a lot faster than we used to be able to. Um, we, we haven't really dug into it, but one of the technical challenges that I, I didn't deal with anyway, <clears throat> excuse me, is that material was too thick to pump and too thin to scoop. So we had to deal with some uh, chemistry there to try and consider using a desiccant to facilitate recovery eventually with a long reach excavator. And so there were some, some challenges there too. Uh, moving on from Simric up into the great Sierra Nevada mountains. Um, this was another challenge that unfortunately 
uh, we have to deal with uh, on a somewhat regular basis is you know remote access. This was way up in the mountains, um, steep cliffs, slippery oil rocks, uh, sat safety hazard, uh, working near water. Um, you know, I, I think uh, Minister Cohen mentioned it at the beginning. We've had over 300 uh, field responses just during the pandemic alone. So a, a lot of challenges here, um, certainly being able to get down and use the UAV uh, to assess what was going on. Uh, one that I thought was interesting uh, as part of this, uh, Ellen Farrow Daniels, who's our hostess with the mostess of this symposium, uh, was engaged in her applied response technology role to look at shoreline washing agents, not because we felt that the oil on the rocks was so significant that it needed to be washed off in, in order to protect the environment, um, but it made the rocks more slippery and the risk of workers getting down and working on rocks next to water on steep cliffs uh, was the challenge. So it was an interesting discussion of using ARTs for worker safety uh, uh, as much as for environmental cleanup. Tom, any thoughts on this one? The, the situation that we ran into on that one was like what Greg was uh, talking about the steepness of the terrain. We we're starting to have the, a good ice pack was melting. So the, the water was rising. We also had a, a uh, casualty involved in this as well that those, those things all restrict our ability to um, move quickly and rapidly because safety of personnel is always our, our paramount concern. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so moving on to our first COVID response, this was early in March. This um, has been mentioned a couple times uh, through here, but uh, through the symposium, uh, we had to mobilize, you know, we, we there was difficulty with uh, communications um, and a couple things that, that I want to mention uh, on it. The the ch one of the interesting things was, you know, we, we just had this lockdown that nobody can go anywhere and nobody can do anything. And so we, you know, the first response is we can't send anybody. Then we don't, I don't mean that literally, but, you know, how few people can we staff? And it led to a lot of, frankly, complicated discussions about what's essential, what's critical, which roles have to be on the ground, what can be done remotely. And what if, you can do it remotely, but not as well. Is that okay? Is that, is that acceptable? Uh, also lessons learned. We, you can see uh, Wendy here releasing the turtles from OWCN. The, uh, we knew that there, had, there were impacted wildlife because it had been observed right off the get-go. Um, you know, the first thought was, well, hey, people are more important. Maybe we don't need to deploy wildlife but um, uh, responders. But, as we worked through that discussion, just using it as an example, um, we knew from previous spills that humans have a real difficulty watching an animal suffer and are likely to take extreme risks to address it. And we knew that if we didn't deploy trained wildlife responders, we were gonna get OSRO personnel, other OSPA or agency personnel, um, volunteers, uh, people were gonna go out and try and rescue the animals anyway, meaning that now we have untrained people doing wildlife rescue who are putting themselves at risk, uh, putting the animals at risk, and then what are they gonna do with them once they pick them up? So it, it, we had to work through all those dialogues to decide, okay, that's that's who we're gonna cover. And that's what's, you know, this, that's a critical function. It has to be deployed. So it, those were really intriguing and, and difficult uh, conversations to have about how do we make sure we're protecting our humans um, while well, at the same time doing everything that needs to be done. Um, and even in, a, in this example, protecting humans from themselves. Um, Tom, you wanna to mention anything on, I know comms was a challenge for you guys out there. Absolutely, there, there were a few main issues that we had. Uh, first and foremost was our communication because we were in steep terrain, a lot of hill surrounding us. So we were able to bring in a a, a mobile repeater system for the cellular service um, that that alleviated that part but then we also were dealing with 
significant rain events at the time. And we were having people that were down in the creek and we would have to have flash flood watches as well because uh, approximately five miles upstream from us was an area that it, the, the weather would move through and drop a lot of rain and we would have to have people would be monitoring to let us know. Uh, another significant thing was our culturally sensitive areas. This was known for a Shumash burial sites through there. So we had that dynamic that we were dealing with. Um, and we were right on the side of a highway, feet from that. So we always had to be very cognizant of, of what was going on, got other agencies involved, CHP taking care of the traffic for us. Um, and that helped a lot. But like Greg was saying, our, our paramount thing with keeping with the personnel safety was COVID protocols. This was our first big incident. We were still trying to establish how close is close. What are we going to be doing? Um, how do we actually get people into the water to start remediating, removing the oil? Uh, so those were significant hurdles that we had to address before we could move on to make sure our people were safety and the environment was protected and the response was done in a, a uh, good manner. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I see we've got about two and a half, three minutes left. Um, we got three more slides, so we're getting there. Um, uh, this was a, a recent event, again, kind of a strange situation with an unknown source there's historic oil production in the area um, you've got a water source that's not really related to the feature itself that is uh, stormwater from a neighboring uh, residential area we did have uh, impacts to wildlife we had covid um, but this was seven months after kiyama and it, it was really interesting just to realize how much we had learned as we went through it um, you know, all the uncertain things, but we were able to ramp up much more quickly and with a higher level of certainty because we developed protocols and procedures. We knew what we had to staff. We had already decided which things were mission critical that had to be on the ground, which things could be done remotely. Um, you know, I was wildlife branch director with Laird Henkel sharing uh, on this one. We weren't, we never went, we were remote. We always would have been, you know, in non COVID time, non pandemic time, but we knew we could function adequately. Uh, remotely and we have one less uh, person that might infect or be infected. So it, it was a really good example. Is it still a tough response, but a, a really good example of you know, learning from our mistakes. Tom, you want to mention anything on this one? I'll do a real brief one on this. Christian Corbo uh, led this from the, the start. And what worked out real well with that one is, is as Greg was saying, we learned a lot of information from our Cuyama River incident. And then we did a lot of training and discussions and we were able to hone a lot of those things in. So when, so once uh, Lieutenant Corbo and, and Warden Van Epps were able to get out there, they were able to address it a lot more effectively and quickly. And we got ahead of it a lot more than we would have been had we not been doing continual training as to what are we gonna do in this uh, new COVID related environment. Yeah, definitely. Um, so just a couple other uh, quick mentions, you know, challenging situations, uh, oiled rattlesnakes, it's, it's real, it's a, it's a thing. And that's, you know, who, who's gonna clean the rattlesnake? Who's gonna hold the rattlesnake while somebody else cleans it? Um, th these are real and challenging things in California. Um, Thankfully, in, the, in this example, our wildlife care network, as well as a lot of our industry partners, a lot of the uh, consultants and things that work for industry have trained snake wranglers with the tools of the trade and are able to do it. But you know, the, the key there is never make a bad situation worse. Um, the, the last thing I wanted to, uh, to mention is, uh, sorry, it's my timer going off. Um, is that uh, you know the continual practice that Senator Anderson just mentioned? We did a large unannounced virtual exercise in partnership with the Coast Guard. Um, we had 30 plus local, state, and federal agencies, um, OSROs, some RPs, our uh, industry partners, and uh, it, the whole focus was to test Zoom, Teams, and Adobe Connect 
and work through those lessons, which do the, some things better, which do some things worse. Uh, really a lot of good lessons learned there. Uh, among other things, we learned that all of the agencies involved had significant limitations on their willingness to allow others into something like Zoom. We can all use, they all do well for these uh, uh, virtual discussions and things, but in terms of file sharing, posting, uploading, downloading, uh, collaboration where we're working on a document collectively on, law, on screen, they, they tend to be limited to your home organization. The industry partners, when they've done some drills recently, were not so scared or whatever as we are and do allow everybody in. So just a simple lesson like that, maybe have, have it hosted by industry rather than by an agency and get better collaboration. Um, so since we're moving on here, um, just a, a few final thoughts. Um, I, I won't read all these to you, but you know, I, I'll just point out that innovation and new approaches should always be front of mind. And sometimes it's better to go with what you know. But those are real things, um, you know, all that. Uh, you can read these on, on your own. Tom, do you have any other concluding thoughts on this? No, the only thing I'm thinking is we all bring special skills and the more that we work with each other and get each other's input on stuff that helps us impact the direction of our response, the better we are. Um, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Yep, me too. Thank you all. Sorry we went a few minutes over, especially heading into a break. Thank you to our session chair, Maria, and to Lindsay and Jenna, who've been amazing all week in terms of backing us up as co-chairs. It's been phenomenal. Uh, this has been a tremendous, uh, event and I appreciate the opportunity to be part of it. Thank you. Excellent. Um, thank you so much, Greg. We really appreciate your presentation and, and Tom, you guys did a, a great uh, great job and I really enjoyed seeing the old wad, um, the oiled rattlesnake. That was pretty exciting. And also hearing about the cow. Um, I think we do have um, a few questions. We may have just time for one and then we'll probably have to um, ask the other one um, online. Jenna, would you like to be the decider? We'll go who got in first. Okay. So. Um, so the first question was from uh, Mia Roberts. How were lasers specifically used to haze wildlife during this response? Sure. So there's, uh, there's a variety of things going on with lasers. And, and Mia, I'm happy to talk to you about it offline as well. Um, there, the utilities in California, PG&E and Edison, uh, both tend to have done some studies that found that green lasers tend to uh, preclude corvids, the crows and ravens, which predate which like to build nests on towers and then predate desert tortoise and things like that. So um, there's that. And then OWCN has, a, has some hazing devices that sort of randomly shoot out lasers in different directions that tend to scare wildlife. Uh, I didn't mention, but all those hazing things, everybody gets, every animal gets habituated to it. So we're constantly trying to get things that change and move and relocate and do that. Um, obviously with lasers, you couldn't do that in an urban area where you'd have you know, shining in someone's window or people think it's a rave going on or whatever. So uh, there are some limitations on where certain things can be deployed, but um, it does have, it, it's the first time I'd seen it deployed and it, it looked pretty uh, scary in a sense. So hopefully it kept that wildlife out. Well, thank you so much, Greg.